Hello, everybody. Coach Anna here. And today I am here with Amy Berger and Dr. Eric Westman. And these two have just wrote a book, and it's a long title. I don't want to get it wrong. End, the End of Carb Confusion. Did I say it right? It's End Your Carb Confusion. End Your Carb Confusion. And they were gracious enough to send me an electronic copy to preview. And I have to say, I'm absolutely thrilled with it. I think that I wish I would have had this years ago when I was struggling with just the whole dieting thing, you know, diet of the week, this and that. And this is so individualized and so personalized to your personal carbohydrate threshold. So it isn't about just keto. It's about whole foods. It's about health. And it's about finding your best fit, a plan that you can live with for life. So do you guys want to tell me how you, uh, came to work together and sure well so i'm one of the early researchers in the field back in 1998 i visited dr atkins and dr e well he had already retired dr eads of protein power fame dr atkins had a clinic with jackie eberstein i visited dr rosedale and dr bernstein all of the like iconic pioneers in the area. And what I did is I was curious and because two of my patients had these great results and I started doing research about it. So I pulled in one of my colleagues, Dr. Will Yancey at Duke. And over the last 20 years, the studies actually look really good. So about uh, eight years after studying at eight years, we opened our own clinic at Duke and we've been using a low carb and keto diet now for 14 years in a private practice at Duke University, um, insurance pay, Medicare, Medicaid. And what I've learned is um, in the trenches of how to do keto, how to make it work right. And also I've learned that not everyone will do keto or, or can do keto or, or even has to do keto. So what we're trying to do is bring our knowledge about keto diets, low carb diets, but also explain why my brother can eat more fruit than I can, you know, why, why are, you know, so many people on earth eating carbs and they look apparently healthy and, you know, so matching the right diet for the right type of person was a goal of ours. And I got to, I met Amy Berger because of her book, The Alzheimer's Antidote, which is a great one. She has a notoriety in the low carb scene for the Alzheimer's antidote and is a professional writer. So I thought, hmm, she also has the idea that keto without the crazy shouldn't be so difficult. So it was a, a great fit. And so we've worked on this book now for a year or, you know, or so. And um, with Victory Belt, a major publisher, it, it looks really nice. And uh, you know, I'm happy um, to share what we've learned over 20 years from Duke uh, with everyone. And how about you, Amy? How are you feeling about this work? I'm, I'm very um, proud of it, very happy that it will be entering the world soon because, you know, we wrote this book because Dr. Westman and I both have been at this a long time, this meaning the low carb sort of keto dietary world and, you know, him from the clinical side as a professional, me at first from the personal side, I mean, I started the Atkins diet basically to lose weight. And that was before I was a professional, you know, nutritionist. And, um, but we've, we've been in this space for a long time. And when, when both of us were new to this, whether it was professionally or personally, it was so much less complicated. It was just, here's the food list. See ya, have a good life. <laughs> and, and that's really all most people needed. And, you know, there was always some little degree of personalization, but for the most part, you just followed the plan and it worked pretty well. And the last few years have seen this explosion in popularity with keto, which is great because there's so much more information, but there's also a lot more misinformation and there's a lot of conflicting noise out there and a lot of, you know, uh, unnecessary detail or detail that is more for like, okay, you've already been doing this for six months or a year. Now you're ready for the advanced course, but you really want to start with the 101 intro kind of basic schematic. And um, we wrote this to drown out all of that noise and to hone, you know, home in on the signal because 
I cannot imagine what it's like to be new to this now when there are so many YouTube channels and Facebook groups and blogs and podcasts and forums and, and Instagram accounts. And where do you even begin? Who do you believe? And, you know, if I was going to believe someone, probably not a bad idea to believe the guy that's been helping thousands of patients for over two decades, like oh, there's a, maybe a reasonable place to start. And, you know, Dr. Westman and I are, are very much on the same page with keeping it simple, straightforward and uncomplicated, realistic yes. and affordable. We're very, very clear in this book that you can eat this way on any kind of budget, whether you want to get all your food from the local farm stand or you're going to go to the discount chain and get whatever's on sale. This can work no matter what your situation is. And don't let anyone tell you different. Well, I think that there's a lot of orthorexia out there now, too, because there's so much information that people become afraid to eat. Well, am I eating the right things? Am I eating the right amount? Am I this? Am I that? I love, 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 love that you guys divided up into you should eat this many cups of, you know, above ground vegetables. You should eat, you know, for each level that you have or each phase that you have, you just it's measuring cups. Like somebody doesn't have to go out and buy a scale. It's the size of your fist. Like this is just, people don't want to stress over what to eat. And I think stressing over what to eat actually causes a lot of problems with overeating and everything else because stress hormones, as we know, increase a lot of biological processes that can cause you to, to, uh, you know, to want to graze or to want to, uh, shove anything in your face to get some relief from that stress. So I love how like low key and easy to understand and kind of like not basic because it isn't basic. It's just truthful, honest, and like you said, straightforward. And I love how you deal with addiction right out of the gate. So tell me, how did you guys decide to go ahead and put that almost right away in the book? <laughs> yeah, because it's so common, right? So, I mean, we're, we're not, um, proclaiming from on high what ought to be. This is a real world. This is um, uh, sugar addiction, carb addiction, food addiction is real for so many people. And uh, we have to make this work, whether you like alcohol, have to avoid it totally or can have a drink or two here and there. So uh, also in my first 10 years of my career was in the field of smoking cessation and nicotine research. So it actually, um, it was very obvious to me going from talking to people who are quitting cigarettes and now going to people who are quitting sugar, the language is almost identical. So that, you know, you crave it when you don't have it, when you have it, it feels so good. And, and uh, so, like, no, you don't have to smoke, you know, but you don't also don't have to eat pure sugar, right? So addiction is real. And, you know, what percent of folks have to be totally avoid sugar and start, I mean, even if it's a small percent, that's a lot of people. And I, I'm actually very glad that we have it in there and that you, you notice that because a lot of people are taught or told by people that, that just want to tell you what you want to hear. Oh yeah, you can have a little of this, can have a little of that. You know, it doesn't bother me as a doctor. You know, look, you're an alcoholic. You can't ever drink again. You know, look, you're a sugaraholic. You can never have sugar again. You know, because that I want to do what's best for your health, not just let you have things that might be harmful. Yeah, but uh, yeah, something something else we made a point to do is, uh, well, I mean, first of all, I it's it's in there because, like he said, it is important. You know, everyone with that problem thinks they're the only one. They're ashamed, so we don't talk about it publicly. We don't fess up or whatever you want to call it because everybody's so embarrassed about it, and yet. If everyone would talk, you would know, oh my, I'm so not the only one. Everybody struggles with this. And um, we also have in there, you know, in an ideal world, like, so two things, in an ideal world, everybody would break their even desire for the sweet taste. You wouldn't even want the keto treats and the, the, key, the almond flour brownies and the erythritol cake, you know, that's the ideal world. What about the world we actually live in? What, how can we make this realistic for people to do, you know, and then because for some people, you know, for many people, 
just going on a strict low carb or ketogenic diet actually does completely get rid of sugar cravings, completely get rid of the desire. What if it doesn't? What if you are one of the people who doesn't get the magic keto fairy dust sprinkled on them? What, what do you do then? How can we construct a way of eating that's still going to work for you? You know how we, we still need this to work. We still want to get your blood sugar down. We want to get rid of the PCOS. We want to get rid of the migraines. We want to get rid of the brain fog. How, how can we navigate this way of eating in a way that will get you there, even if it's not the perfect ideal thing? I love that too, because I think that there's a starting point for people. And then from there, they can learn for themselves what works. And I saw that in the personal stories in your book, because people would say, I used to eat these keto treats and I found out that they were just as addictive for me as, you know, these other treats were. And they didn't want to opt out of the high nutrient density, um, good feelings, not having that constant noise. What can I eat next? You know, because if you're a food addict like me, you wake up in the morning when I was having cravings, I would wake up in the morning, eat something, and then wonder what could I eat next? I was thinking about food 24 seven. I called myself a foodie. I'm a great cook, you know, all of these things. And I jokingly called myself a food junkie all the time. And I made these elaborate meals and then I would still want something to eat an hour later, you know, because it was just constantly the obsession and compulsion is what makes it addiction. And it's exposure to sugars when we're young. And I think, you know, a lot of people that were bottle fed and things like that had such early exposure to such high sugar, high carb things that actually do have an impact on your dopamine reward center and on your hormones and everything else. And so, you know, I think it's great that you allow that food plan to develop over time. I also loved in phase two, where you talk about you might be able to increase your carbohydrates or you might be able to start here depending on what is your metabolic condition. Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have a high hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of sugar coated red blood cells, you know, and, and, and people don't really know that. I always tell my husband, show them the chart so they can see what their, what their blood sugar is compared to the hemoglobin A1C because he's a cardiologist. And once they see that, they're like, oh, because you're speaking Greek to them. If you just talk about hemoglobin A1C, and I love how you guys like really break that stuff down into something understandable for people because that's so important because I don't believe people want to hurt themselves. They just don't know that they're hurting themselves. I think um, Dr. Westman, you had talked about calling it um, hyperinsulinemia and then you broke it down into the three parts of the words. And you mentioned Dr. Bernstein, who I am a huge fan of. I mean, what an amazing man. I would love to interview him. (laughs) I can't believe he's still going like he's going. I heard um, one of my husband's partners is actually a type one diabetic. And he said that he thinks that he's the oldest living type one diabetic. And that- He's he's in his mid eighties. And still works. Dr. Richard K. Bernstein, yeah. So anyway, so so what other things did you guys, because it seemed like you really tried to put yourself in the position of that newbie. And, and everything they needed to know. So, so uh, what other kinds of things did I miss talking about that you guys included in there that you're really proud of? Yeah, well, I like the idea that um, someone may be scared of keto or carbs or, or they've kind of just listened and, uh, you know, I'm never gonna give up my bread or, you know, I'm, I'm never gonna, you know, why well, I can't have a peach, you know? So we're trying to make this Again, just sharing what we learned about sugar and what happens in the blood and in the body when you have too much sugar and explaining that if your metabolism, explaining in, in easy terms, not we don't talk about the blood sugar levels and all this in great detail. It's more, you know, do you have a tendency toward these conditions and you fill in a, a, a table, just a check type of table where at, then at the bottom you'll add up well, I should be in this category, this category, this category. And there are only three categories that we have to get people started or to roughly get you uh, along that spectrum. So we really wanted this, to, you know, <laughs> the classic book author is, we want everyone to read this book. I, I do think the audience is, is much broader than the keto 
echo chamber. We tried really hard to take out any sort of language that's too promotional or too derogatory. You know, we, we don't say that they're bad fats and bad carbs and all that. It's just really, again, telling you the story of what carbs do. And some people have to moderate them. And so I hope we can have a, a much wider audience than the keto echo chamber. I mean, for, for me, there's two big, big aspects of the book that I think are important. And, and part of that, you know, the book, there's nothing on the cover that says anything about keto, you know, end your carb confusion. It's, it's a simple guide, customizing optimal health. There's nothing about keto. So hopefully it's not off-putting to people that just want a healthy diet. But, you know, two of the things that we really kind of hammered home throughout the book is that, you know, so many people will pick up a book like this because they want to lose weight. And weight loss is, is certainly a very powerful thing that can happen when you eat this way. But how many millions upon millions of people out there have all kinds of, of health problems, whether just little sort of everyday bothersome stuff to downright, you know, deadly things they're dealing with that, you know, but, but they're at a normal weight, a quote unquote normal weight. Well, eating in a, in a somewhat carbohydrate restricted way can improve a lot of those massively without weight loss. Like, like, low carb can help you lose weight. It can also help you stay at a normal weight if you're already there. It can help you gain weight. You know, it, wherever you are, you can eat this way to get where you want to go. So it's not just about weight. And then the other thing that is such a huge point to, to both of us is that it's, you, you hear keto and you, you automatically think two things. You think weight loss and you think diabetes, especially type two diabetes. Again, look at all the zillions of people that have normal blood sugar, so they're not diabetic. And because they don't have diabetes and their blood sugar is normal, and even the A1C is normal, the doctor says, well, I don't know why you have acne. I don't know why you have brain fog. I don't know why you have hypoglycemia and PCOS and a fatty liver and hypertension and skin tags. And I can't explain any of this. Sorry, see you in six months. So we really, really are big on explaining the role of high insulin, even when your blood sugar is normal, because high insulin is a major factor in all that other stuff. And so few people are aware of that. You know, Ben Bickman is talking about it a lot now. Jason Fung talks about it, but it's not, we need to reach even more people out there outside of our little keto bubble. Yes, and I think that it's, it's so interesting, the hypoglycemia piece. That seems to really be a thinner person problem a lot. You know, I, I passed out, you know, in my teens, I remember going to, to a Marine World in the Bay Area and I dropped my purse and I had eaten a big bowl of sugary cereal with, you know, skim milk for breakfast. I dropped my purse, I bent down to pick it up and I passed out because I was hangry, you know, I was, my blood sugar was dropping and I always explain it to my clients this way, here's your baseline you know, blood sugar, and then you eat this extraordinary amount of carbohydrates and your insulin is like perceiving that as poison essentially, because you cannot have that much glucose in your blood. And that's where we drop down. And that these kinds of things were not happening until we started eating more processed foods. And so what you guys are really great at doing is saying like, don't eat processed foods, period. You know, don't have these be a staple of, of your way of eating. In fact, I would, I mean, I would call this book like quit dieting and, and start eating foods that support your health that you enjoy. You know, I mean, that's, that's what this seems like to me. Here's something, try to find something you can live with over the long haul. And I love how you always like comfort people and you're, and you're really saying like, you don't have to stay on phase one, like, let's see how you do. But I also love how you caution people to very slowly elevate those carbohydrates because just going gung ho out of the gate, you're never going to find out what your threshold is. So it sounds to me like you're saying like you, you go from the 20 uh, grant total grams and I love that you do total grams. That's, you know, stops people from eating a big old fiber bar with 21 grams of fiber, that, you know, I mean, that that's problematic in and of itself, if you ask me, but to just add in a little bit of carbohydrate at a time, like it sounds to me like you're thinking like 10 or 15 grams for, you know, a week and see how you do with that before you, you know, you might, you may have to back down again for a minute 
or you could maybe, maybe you're like, hey, this is great. I'm going to hang out here for a minute and then I'll see if I can go a little bit further and see how far you can push the envelope without, you know, bringing back a lot of those symptoms that you mitigated in the first place. So I love that. Well, this is, um, that's basically what Dr. Robert Atkins originally had as his plan. You know, there was the, the induction phase, which is like Dr. Westman's page four. I mean, that's kind of what it was based on. I mean, that's where the total carbs comes from is, is the page four diet. Um, but everyone forgets, you know, when people think of Atkins, they think induction, they're really strict. They lose 50 pounds, everything's great. And then they immediately just go back to their normal diet. Like it's just this binary thing where in, in, in Dr. Atkins books, actually, there was this, he called it the carb ladder and you very gradually increased your carb intake to, to find your own sweet spot. And Dr. Westman can tell the story. I mean, he, he met Dr. Atkins personally that many patients were not able to do that. Some patients had to stay at the induction level for, for their whole life. It's the only place that they could maintain a healthy weight or keep their medical problems in remission, but some could go a little bit up the ladder. Yeah, it's very interesting because in my house, you know, we have a teenager, she's 16, and she, she eats all kinds of natural carbohydrates, but we don't keep flour or gluten or anything like that in the house. For one thing, I have celiac, I have five autoimmune diseases. So I'm zero carb and pretty high fat, not, you know, enough protein, but not high protein because my autoimmune disease responds better that way. And then my husband, who's a cardiologist, you know, he likes doing the whole intermittent fasting thing and he'll, he can step out on the carbs once in a while. And he has a lot more like metabolic flexibility than I do. Um, but he did, um, you know, he did do a, a nice time period where he got himself keto adapted and fat adapted as well. So I think even 50 carbs or less, even on the, the phase two, will get people um, fat adapted if they stay there long enough. You don't have to be ultra low carb or zero carb in order to become a fat adapted person. And I love how you guys are like, get rid of the scale, don't measure, and how you use um, the idea of the size of your fist is about, you know, one serving of your vegetables and you can have, you know, two fists on phase one or two cups on phase one plus your lettuce, plus, you know, it just makes it like so simple. And I think um, people shouldn't have to like, feel like they have to get a degree to eat a plate of food, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, people are eating in a healthy way before we measured anything, right? Before there were apps, before there were scales. And, and uh, so, you know, um, Dr. Atkins had a lot of wisdom and, I was a, well, I met him a few times. He passed away in uh, 2003. I remember I, I had done a couple studies and uh, got to know he and his wife and um, then the Atkins group. And, but I, I um, so I couldn't learn from him anymore, but I have learned from the nurse that worked with him for 30 years, Jackie Eberstein. And so she's been one of my teachers through the years mentors and and you know if I have a real difficult case I send him to send her him or her to Jackie and she figures it out so uh, but when you went to visit Dr. Atkins office they had a different approach than what the book said so I think this and your carb confusion actually um, portrays what was going on in the clinics of Dr. Atkins, Dr. Eads, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Rosedale more than what their books said and I think a major factor is that time has changed and we can say things like, go ahead and eat fat yeah. without the stuttering. You know, f -f 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 we have cardiologists like your husband who say, fine. You know, of course I coach my patients to say, say you're doing a Mediterranean diet and then they'll think it's great. Yeah, so, but I think times have changed and uh, the, what we've learned is really kind of a common theme of all of the low carb keto doctors and including now the idea that, well, you don't have to do, uh, you don't have to keto perhaps, but if you need it, it's okay. I think the fat thing is interesting too because the American Cardiology Association has come out and said in JAMA that there is no association between high fat and, cl and cholesterol. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, well, which is which is what the science says. So yay. <laughs> uh, but there's, yeah, still, you know, there's still a little bit. I don't think their official kind of guidance has changed. They can publish an article like that and still not, you still kind of be a little hesitant to say, well, we don't need a cap on fat then, or we don't need a cap on saturated fat. Um, it's, it's changing. It's just changing really, really slowly. Yeah, the mixed messaging of the, the political organizations is tough for a lot of people. I mean, who wouldn't then go back and have Snickers candy bars that you'll find the one one organization that says, hey, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> of course, it's not going to, you won't get the results you want. And that's another important concept most people may not understand is that most doctors have no training in nutrition. And most doctors have no training in, in weight loss. And uh, so I went out to get special training. And that's all I do, you know, is, is help people change their lifestyles. And so I'm sharing that knowledge with something that has to work. I'm, it, you know, in a practice like mine, if what I did didn't work. No one would come back to me. No one, you know, no one, I wouldn't have a job <laughs> there. You know, I'm in the insurance system, but still you have to have people come back with results. Uh, so that's another uh, bonus about this is, you know, it's going to work if you do it and if you find the right carb level. Well, and I think too, aside from there are many doctors now I'm in, I'm in Grand Island, Nebraska, and there are doctors here that want their, um, they want their patients to go low carb. They want them eating eggs and bacon and ditching the cereal, but they're constricted by time as well. And so, you know, they're stacked one appointment after another. So having a book like you, like you guys wrote to be able to offer to their clients, because I know my husband, I mean, half of the doctors that I work with in town, they should be getting commission from Dr. Jason Fung for both of his books, The Obesity Code and The Diabetes Code. And I know that my husband and his colleagues are gonna be thrilled with your guys' book. Um, you know, I think it's just gonna be so helpful because you can send somebody home with something that's easy to understand. And I have to say, even though I think Jason Fung makes things easy to understand, it still does have a little medical bent to it and my husband has gotten people coming back to his office saying, I don't get it. I don't understand. You know, well, I used to be a nurse, so my brain works a little different than, you know, somebody else's brain. And so that was interesting to me because something I thought was simple to understand, some people don't think is simple to understand. So if you guys ask me, you have the corner in the market on the best onboarding to a healthy eating book that there is. And I'm going to be thrilled as a health coach to be able to offer it to people, um, even food and sugar addicts, because it won't contradict what I'm saying to them, that you need to stay stopped on anything that triggers you, you know? And, and that, like we discussed even before we started videoing, you know, that if something makes you hungry, if you're adding something to your plate and two hours later you're feeling like snacking or you're feeling cravings maybe that particular food or that particular thing is triggering you into that food addiction cycle and so for some people that might not be berries but it might be the stone fruit you know um it's interesting because different people are so different i know people that are sugar addicts that can't have one piece of fruit and i can even though i tend to be more um carnivore 99% of the time, I can have a half a cup of blueberries here and there without triggering any cravings at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but, but I could eat something else like say too many tomatoes and my joints are killing me and that's five autoimmune diseases acting up, you know? So, so yeah. I think it's just everybody, uh, the permission that you give to kind of play and experiment and be the boss of your own food choices. I think that that's, that offers well, a lot of dignity to people. Oh, that, that's what a beautiful way to phrase that. Thank you so much. That was like, wow, I, our book is even better than I hoped, my gosh. <laughs> but um, like, like for me, I, I, I'm a coffee junkie. I will never be a black coffee girl. I'm going to put cream in it or half in it. I'm going to put some kind of sweetening agent in it. And, but I can do that. I can have a little sweetness to my coffee 
and go about my day. It doesn't make me want to have a cookie with the coffee or a, a, a chocolate croissant or something. Like it's just, it's a little sweet coffee and that's it. It doesn't trigger anything for me. But you know, there's certain foods of course that, that will trigger me, but I, it really is, um, there's no right or wrong way to eat this way. There's only what works for you. And some people, like you mentioned earlier, you don't have to be in the actual state of ketosis to reap a lot of the benefits of a lower carb way of eating. And that's what the whole, our whole book, even the highest level, our, our phase three, is relatively lower carb compared to what most people are eating. But compared to strict keto, it's very generous with carbs. Um, so they're all carb restricted to some degree, but there's a lot of flexibility and it's all customizable to what you enjoy and what works in your life. And, um, you know, the, the major, the, the major premise that has gotten lost in all of the stuff that's out there is the, the, the keeping the carbs lower and how low you need to go depends on your situation. But that's what this is about. It's not about omega-6, omega-3. It's not about organic. It's not about whatever mTOR. It's not about too much protein does this or not enough this. Maybe that's important at a, you know, much, much higher level. Maybe it's not right now. Let's just think about the carbs. <laughs> right. And there's not a lot of evidence for some of that hocus no. pocus anyway. A Most lot of it sounds the, good. The, motor, the, right, the histamines, so all of that is subject. It's really subjective. It's not at all clinically proven. So to me, like so going there just... Say, show me a study bring me a study right it just stresses people out and not know. a rat study bring me a clinical trial <laughs> in human six months what is your rule well the the study we published in 2002 was 50 people over six months published in a peer-reviewed journal then i'll comment on it <laughs> now, I, i've looked at reams of allergy testing for the blood and all for for food and it, you know when you're just eating real foods and the things that are possible offenders are, are such low in, in um, amount, many of these things just don't apply. So that, you know, yes, I, I am getting more enamored with the idea that, you know, why do you ever need to eat plants? You know, food put, uh, plants put, you know, toxins in their food so mammals won't eat them, you know? And uh, I asked Amber O'Hearn to write a paper on the essential nutrients. Uh, can you get all you need in a carnivore diet? And she made a pretty good case. We published that in a journal uh, October 2020. But I asked her to write it. I'm not an author on it. But, um, you know, um, the sensitivities and all these, most of the time, it goes away. And I have to think a lot of that's because of the just general inflammation that people feel, including autoimmune types of inflammation and joint pains and and that just that noise goes down when you get most of the garbage garbage out um, so even people who have lactose intolerance if you're just having a small amount of cream or cheese they do fine you know so there isn't this whole anyway what the brilliance of the method we use and end your carb confusion is that it came from doctors who were in the clinics they developed this over time, over you know, tens of thousands of patients, and then I added on maybe another 5,000, but and then did the research to say that it was safe and effective. But um, it's um, a great method for it's gluten free, right? So if you're you, you have a gluten problem, it, it, it's FODMAP free, meaning the the simple sugars. Um, uh, it, it really cuts across a lot of different therapeutic diets without doctors knowing about it. <laughs> yes. you know, and I always yeah. tell my clients, don't tell your doctor you're doing keto, tell them you're going to stop eating processed food and that you need help really? with medications. And I remind them, you don't need your doctor's permission to decide what you're going to put in your mouth or not. But if you are on medications and you guys point that out, then you must have communication with your physician. You must. It's your responsibility to yourself. Some, I mean, some people drastically, they can get off their insulin in less than a week. I've seen it happen so many times. And I have a client that in I a have, day. Yeah. One day, be careful, one day. Sorry. I have a client who he has lost over a hundred pounds now. 
And you know what? He went out and he played poker on Friday nights and he ate the topping off of pizza. That was part of his way of eating. And his hemoglobin A1C was something like 13 or 14 or something. And it's five something now, you know? And he's in his seventies and he's feeling like he's 20 years younger and, and it's amazing. And so I love how you point out that you can go through the drive through grab a hamburger, take the buns off, throw them away and eat it. And it's fine. I actually interviewed a friend of mine, James Saida, and he never cooks at home. He eats out all the time in Omaha. And he posts pictures of, see, you can do keto anywhere. You know, you, you can eat low carb anywhere. And a lot of people, um, you know, they, they like to be superior and say things to him about that. And I'm like, you know what, dude, you, you were on death's door. You had a hemoglobin A1C of 15 something. You know, your abdominal girth was bigger than Santa Claus. And now look at you, you're healthy. You don't owe anybody an explanation for what you choose to eat. And I think that that's something we've lost respect for. Yeah. I don't because I have to, and I choose to eat a certain way. And of course I can't just take a bun off of a hamburger because I have celiac. I can't do that. But I don't have to judge somebody else's right to do that. I don't have to judge someone else for what they're eating. And I love that about your book. Thank you. We, we borrowed, or maybe I should say stole a line from our friend Casey Durango. I don't know if we, we may have changed the phrasing a little bit, but she, she says, nobody else gets a vote on what you eat. And that's so true. You're a grown adult, an autonomous adult. Eat what you want. And yeah, I mean, how... You know, the funny thing is when somebody is 400 pounds and taking six medications and injecting insulin, nobody comments when they sit down and eat a burger and fries and a milkshake, but heaven forbid you toss the muffin off the bacon, egg and cheese sandwich. And then all of a sudden the world has gone crazy and everyone feels entitled to comment on what you're eating. Where were they 300 pounds ago? Where were they when you were on the verge of losing a foot? Now, all of a sudden they're worried about your health? Come on. Well, and I feel the same way, like with, with clients that come back and they're like, oh, I messed up. I drank a soda. And I'm like, okay, you were drinking 64 ounces of soda a day. <laughs> and then you drink eight, one eight ounce soda. And Over the course of the month. You up about it. I'm like, that's progress. Good for you. And they're like, what? You know, and I, and I like to tell my clients, I like to kind of blow their minds. Hey, you can eat whatever you want, whatever you want to eat, you can eat. I am not the food police. It's completely up to you what you want to do on any given day. And somehow that relaxes people, I think. And they feel like I am in control. I am in charge. And I think that that's, you know, there's too much shame and guilt. Think of all these revolving door, the, the billions of dollars, it's over a $300 billion diet industry and it's projected to be up to 600 billion in the next 10 years because diets don't work, diets fail. People don't fail. How can you stick to something that keeps you hungry? And you guys address that too, that your appetite naturally de decreases. One of my clients this morning, she promised me she's going to throw her scale away. She, she's doing great. She's eating right. Her markers are going down. Everything's happening. But she wants to get under that 200-pound mark. You guys, she's weighing herself four times a day. <laughs> I said, you have to throw that scale away. It's going to keep you above 200 because the cortisol alone, it's going to keep you, it's going to keep you, you know, too stressed out to lose any weight. I'm afraid she's not the only one who weighs four times a day. <laughs> we do recommend once a week. Um, but there's a saying, and, and this gets into the sort of, oh, it's personality and the, the, the um, oh, it's projecting of other diets onto this one and, and how people bring in shame, guilt. And, you know, when, when a program doesn't work, you have to put the thumb screws on the shame, the guilt, the, you know, social, you know, public weighing every week. Oh, you know, goodness. You know, so yeah, you have to match the right diet for the people. And then the, the idea that progress is what you want, not perfection and, and relieving the anxiety that again, it's people bring it over from other teachings that uh, if, if you begin this way, people come back telling me, well, why are, why do people make such a big deal about weight loss? It's so easy. Well, because you haven't tried anything else. <laughs> so, um, 
of all of the things, there are lots of ways to lose weight. This one, it just seems so simple and we try to make it simple. And uh, that was the main point for the book that it's gotten so confusing out there. People don't know where to start. So we wanted to bring the things down to the brass tacks, you know, the basics. What do you really need to know? And that will, will help you, uh, you know, whether you need to be really strict or not so strict. Well, and Amy, I think you guys also go over a body recomposition and that there's a difference between you could be, you could actually have a stall just because you're, you know, you're eating food that's nourishing now. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so important to that conversation about the scale because, um, and maybe if, if we can, if you have show notes, I wrote a very long blog post about why the scale is not always the best tool to use when you're trying to get healthier, even when you are trying to change your shape and size, because that's, that's what most people want, especially the ladies out there. You don't really care what the number on the scale says. You want to look different. You want to wear a different size clothing. And it is not uncommon for a woman to go down a dress size or two with no change in scale weight. Because if you were previously basically starving yourself and now you're eating nourishing food, you might be regaining bone mass that you lost. You might be rebuilding muscle mass that you lost just because you weren't eating enough protein for so many years. And so you, you, it, is, it is entirely possible to get smaller while your scale weight doesn't change. Now, of course, if your starting weight is very hot, if you are 250, 300, 400 pounds, you will see the scale come down pretty quickly, but the everyday little blips up and down two to three pounds are normal. You can't freak out about that. Um, so, you know, you can weigh, but we also encourage use a tape measure, get, get a pair of pants that's really tight, try it on once a month. You know, there's, there's other ways to tell. And of course, we're very big too on keep track of other things besides your weight. Is, how's your heartburn? Is your skin getting clear? Do you have more energy? You know, these are things that people like, do your joints hurt less? Even if you have a lot of weight to lose, the joint pain and the heartburn shock people, how quickly they go away, even when they haven't, they've hardly lost any weight. Cause it's not about the weight, it's about what's going on inside. And so that, I think that helps people stay motivated. Even if the scale isn't moving, they can say, well, I didn't have to take my blood pressure medication this week. And I, you know, this is better and this is better, but it's unfortunately for, for the women more so than the men, they, they kind of lose sight of that. You know, like I've had clients, Dr. Westman has probably had patients who say, well, yeah, you know, my blood sugar's better and my reflux is gone and my periods are regular, but why are, why isn't this diet working? Because they're specifically talking. I think sometimes it's why don't I look like a supermodel? Yeah. Why, why don't I look like a I'm 55. 19. I'm not going to look like a supermodel. You know, let's, I think I look good for 55. That's fine with me. I look like I'm supposed to look. You know, I recently, I hardly ever weigh myself in about six months ago, I decided I wanted to put on more muscle because I'm, you know, I'm like a three and a half ring finger. I'm five, four. So I started, uh, working out with the X3 bar and I put on 10 pounds and I didn't gain an ounce. I mean, I didn't, it, or I didn't gain a size. I'm still a size four, which by the way, I never thought I'd be a size four at 55. I'm, not, I'm like the same size I was at 23 at 55. And, you know, and I was up to at one point at 16, I was on prednisone, you know, like 30 gram, 30 milligrams a day. And of course that, you know, puffed me up and the fur on the face, the skin tags. I mean, I'm sure I was pre-diabetic at the time, but you know, I didn't, I, I forgot about the scale and I went from, you know, like an eight where I would have been happy to live the rest of my life to a six to a four effortlessly, not because I'm not starving myself and I'm not thinking about food all the time because uh, I learned to listen to my body the way you guys are talking about. So I see a lot of like, trust the process if you just simply follow instructions in this book, this is going to work and your body slowly over time will land where it's supposed to. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I, and I'm just struck at how as a physician, I'm an internal medicine physician, now obesity medicine physician, that I practice the best internal medicine I ever have. I mean, so I, I treat heart problems and diabetes and high blood pressure and all these things that 
I was uh, trained to use medications for. So now I take away the medicines and it, and it is so unbelievable, people don't believe it. So that's why I follow, you know, the way I got into this is Dr. Atkins invited me to his office in 1998. He, you know, sensed a stalemate and said, you know, I'm gonna have to just invite this guy to my office. You know, I, I, I never asked him afterwards, but, but I went. And so I, I have doctors who come to my office and it, it takes that level of immersion in it to overcome all of the barriers that we put in there. You know, the guardrails that wouldn't let you do anything that raised the LDL one point or, or even, you know, uh, you know, saturated fat in the food or, you know, those are all peripheral things. And it's really a pleasure to be able to put this in a readable form. Uh, you know, the, the uh, research percolating to the clinical world, fat is not the problem in the food. That's been known for a long time. And it's the socio-political economic forces that make it so you don't hear it every day. And so we're, we're we hope starting a trend of a number of books that are going to be, you know, not saying fat's bad, but you want to limit fats and sugars. And, you know, so it's really, if there was a, a, a devil or demon, and I know Amy doesn't like me to demonize anything, but the sugar, it's the sugar itself, unbridled sugar, way too much sugar. It, that's really where the health problems are from. Well, and you're talking about processed sugar, really. I mean, yes. for anything that comes in a powder, it's, you know, it's well, but not I, meant to be eaten and the amounts we're eating it in. It just isn't. But, but if all you had was fruit, for example, all day long without protein, you know, so there is a extreme way of, of um, messing things up. So the amount matters, uh, even of the natural stuff. But uh, you, we do recommend natural sources of carbs, of course, including fruits and berries and, and nuts and all that for those who can tolerate them. Right. And I think it's interesting too, because as a food addiction specialist, nuts are one of those things that used to be like at Christmas funerals and weddings. And now since Dr. Oz got on TV and was like, you have to eat an ounce of this, an ounce of that, you know, if you ate everything Dr. Oz said that you should eat, you would be eating all day. That would be your full-time job, you know? And so people are eating their, I have to have my almonds. I have to have my, you know, my macadamia nuts, whatever. And it's like, no, you don't. Just, just well, eat when you're hungry, eat real food, eat a meal, you know, don't snack and then move on. You know, of, it's all, the low, of all the low carb foods, nuts have to be the most problematic as a trigger food or addictive uh, food, right? I mean, that, I, I don't let people have nuts at first and uh, you know, unless you can demonstrate, you can control them. Uh, and that, you know, after a couple of days, you don't miss them. That's the other interesting thing about this. This is easier than, remember, I spent 10 years helping people quit smoking. Now that is a tough job. This is a lot easier than that, even though it's tough, I know, but it, anyway, there may be uh, drugs to help people get off the sugar addiction at some point. We're, we're seeing in anti-obesity drugs, actually medications to treat uh, addictions, the naltrexone, opioid, drugs. Uh, it's interesting to see that overlap. It's not just the, the brain lighting up with sugar and all that. It's actually in the applied science of drugs. They can be helpful. Contrave is a drug used for obesity that actually has the um, uh, bupropion and naltrexone in it, which is interesting. Well, it's all fascinating, really. I mean, I think Dr. Lustig is doing some excellent work out there. And I also think that, you know, uh, addiction interactive disorder cannot be um, underestimated. You look at people that get a, a stomach procedure then, a stapling or, you know, some kind of sleeve or whatever. And a lot of times they then become alcoholics because that's just another form of sugar. Uh, or they, you know, just the trade-off of addictions, the people that quit smoking, all of a sudden they're eating too much and they're eating, they're craving sugars and this and that because that dopamine wants a hit. And so... The underlying untreated addiction is a big part of it too, I believe. And the shame yeah, and of guilt. We have to get rid of the stigma of addiction so that people aren't dying from you. Because you know, you may not die quickly from a food addiction, but people die. I buried a, a good friend at 50 years old 
who had her right leg slowly amputated to above knee, wouldn't give up her cigarettes and wouldn't give up her Cheetos and wouldn't give up her pop. And she left children still at home. And that was this year. So I mean, that's unbelievably tragic. And I think this is why, you know, it's, it's nice to hear Dr. Westman talk about some of these appetite suppressing drugs and because there is a, you know, we, we tend to demonize medication in the low carbon keto world. Like, oh, because keto should fix everything. And if you, you know, you must not be doing it right if you still have hypertension or you still have something. And, as, you know, especially with this sort of burden of food addiction, and it's not always just sugar and carb addiction. I think that's the most common, but there are people who will just overeat on anything. Um, we should embrace modern medical technology where it can be helpful. And some people really need that extra leg up and, and we should embrace that for the people that, even the surgery, you know, I know that's very controversial to say because it, it fails so very often for the long term, but there are some people who need something that drastic to get them to make behavioral changes they weren't able to make on their own. When they are literally forced to make them, they make them and then they can move on. But so I think we, we should, addiction like that and food, you know, obesity, if we want to classify it as a disease, it's so intractable and so difficult to deal with. Why shouldn't we embrace every tool at our disposal? The keto diet, the drugs, the surgery, the, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy, everything, every, whatever works. So I have to confess, yeah. I have to confess in my practice at Duke, I've prescribed medicine and I've sent people to weight loss surgery. Mm -hmm. Not many, <laughs> if, they, if they just follow the principles of, of keto, they don't need it, but some people will need that. You know, we were thinking about addiction and, and I was thinking of AA and 12 step programs. Overeater, Overeaters Anonymous is available. I, I, Amy, maybe you could comment about that. It's helpful for many, many people. Yeah, I mean, just different things work for different people. Some people need that kind of support. Um, Can you describe um, what OA is and what it does? It's a it's a twelve step program. I mean, it's a it's a support program. They have in person, even so. We're, we're whenever people listen to this, we're in the times of COVID and. Some places are having face-to-face -face meetings these days, some places aren't, but there's always phone meetings, there's Zoom meetings, there's online. It's just support and OA is not, it's called Overeaters Anonymous, but it's not just for overeating, it's any food problem. They have people with anorexia, bulimia, exercise addiction, even um, compulsive undereating. But this is, this takes the stigma and shame out of it. You know, and I think you're part of David Wolf's group. He has a support yes. group. And we are actually opening up a Sugar X Global as a subscription service on a platform called Circle. And people will have access to meetings all the time, not to mention like experts coming in and talking about how does your body work? Because that's something that I think 12 step programs don't do. And so it's, there's like, there's so many pieces to the, to this whole thing of addiction and the addiction interactive disorder. And when we focus on one manifestation of the disease, we're in a lot of trouble, you know, because usually sugar addiction and food addiction is the primary disease. In other words, the early exposure, you could be four or five years old and begging. You just watch kids have a meltdown in the grocery store and you see it right there. And then you see that their neurons that uh, fire together, wire together. And so now they, they have to have it. When you see a toddler begging for a juice box, I mean, that breaks my heart because I know now they're at risk for all kinds of other addictions because it's just one disease, many outlets. And so the failure to understand that is huge in the addiction community. And I would say too, just, and it's actually something we bring up in the book is the, the heartbreaking part of that is that's not that child just trying to be disrupted. It, it is a very strong physical, physiological thing happening. Like when you had the hypoglycemia and you passed out, you didn't invent that. That was a physical you know, urge. And we, we talk about that, like you were saying, you, you cannot stick to a way of eating that keeps you perpetually hungry, that keeps you on that blood sugar and insulin roller coaster. And um, so for the people that have food addiction or, you know, I mean, there's other aspects to that, but, you know, we talk in the book about how if you are one of these people where, you, 
at breakfast, you're thinking about what you're having for lunch. At lunch, you're thinking about what you're having for your snack. At your snack, you're the what's for dinner. Keto can quite literally change your life. Yes. Like, like our, we have a friend, Christy Sullivan, you may know her. She's a very popular cookbook author now. Um, she, when she first started keto and she started with Dr. Weston's page four plan, she, I think she said to you something like, for the first time in my life, I'm not hungry. And it's not like you don't invent hunger in your mind. If your body is reacting to those foods such that it's keeping you hungry, it's like, and, and we do, we, we try to take all the guilt and shame and self-blame out of it because it's not your fault. It's literally a physical reaction to the food. You just have to change the food. <laughs> Biochemistry is... I mean, it is so intricate. I mean, if you really get into it, then you're looking at the gut microbiome, which is where neuro neurotransmitters are largely manufactured. And you're looking at depression and all kinds of things that when we are eating too high of sugar, too, you know, things that are feeding these bad gut bacteria, then we're interfering with our own ability to manufacture serotonin and all of these little things that go into it. So you could write volumes on this really. And never, it, the big thing is you have to abstain from those things that are going to cause you harm. And I love that you guys put that at the get-go. That was so, I think, bold and brave. And I mean, as a person that I, my whole goal in life is to help people get free of the slavery of addiction. I also have 31 years clean off of drugs, you know, and, and uh, just since I learned about my food and sugar addiction, I've never had so much peace in my life, even with the 12 steps, even with, you know, years of being sponsored and being a sponsor and being involved in the rooms of 12 step programs, getting rid of that noise and that clutter and that, I mean, I used to throw it in the trash and take it out of the trash. And, you know, you do, you're doing all the stuff that causes you a feeling of guilt and shame and degradation, and you're doing it against your will. That's the thing about addiction. You know, you shouldn't eat the ice cream. You don't want to eat the ice cream, but then you go and you eat the ice cream because of the biochemical draw and pull for it. So there is definitely a detox. And I actually wish that we had inpatient detox for, for food addicts, especially severe ones whose health is at super high risk where they could be monitored and that kind of thing. I doubt that our country will ever pay for something like that. They would rather pay to have Pop-Tarts be a whole grain choice in our school system. I don't know about where you guys live, but here in Nebraska, Pop-Tarts and those little waxy chocolate donuts, they are what they're giving to kids for breakfast. And since COVID, all kids, regardless of how much money their families have, are entitled to free drug foods, I call them, at the school. And you know, um, two Pop-Tarts have over 70 grams of carbohydrate in them. And this is just heartbreaking to me. And it's ridiculous that a country like ours would co-sign that BS. You know, so I'm grateful for people like Robert Lustig and people like you guys. And I hope that you, you know, consider writing a book for younger people directed towards, you know, kids, uh, maybe, because something needs to be done so that kids can be healthy. And I know there's a lot of teenagers out there. And I've had, um, you know, the experience with people, you, you talked about other eating disorders. Well, those are just manifestations of addiction. When you're restricting, you're just trying to control the food. And, it, and we always try to control, well, I could stay stopped for this long, so now I can use again. That's the, that is the whole premise of addiction, right? I got off of my phone for, for three days, now you're on your phone, you know, all day long again, because, you know, you could control it for three days. So we could go on forever, you guys. Is there any final thought that you would like to leave my audience with? Well, on, on your last thoughts, um, I've been trying to get Amy to write the next books on, you know, no more acne, which is so targeting a certain thing that teens are, are especially worried about, you know, and no more menstrual cramps. These are, these are targeted things that get better on keto. You have to, when you write the book that says this fixes everything, no one believes you, but if you can target just one thing, it, it will, would help. Uh, well, but, uh, you know, just um, thank you so much for having us on the podcast to be able to share what we hope to help lots and lots of people, or it's not the fat in the food that's bad. It, it, the whole pendulum is swinging, and and uh, if we can help more people with that knowledge, that's just, just that's what we're here for. 
Well, I appreciate both of you guys, your valuable time. And, and like I said, the book, it will definitely be getting, uh, you know, my stamp of approval with all of my clients and I will be buying extra copies to pass out to doctors here in town, which I did with Amy's Alzheimer's book and everybody loved it. So I think and it's if, great. If you could just mention that it is available for pre-order. I'm not sure when the show will be live, but it's called End Your Carb Confusion. You can find it on Amazon. You can probably find it on other online booksellers. Yeah, he's got it right there. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I have already pre hundred extra copies for all your friends. It makes a great Christmas present. <laughs> well, and you know, um, one thing that I think is interesting too, for those that are kind of keto experts and you think, well, I don't need this book, you probably don't. If you're, if you're good where you're at, you probably don't. But you've probably been trying to evangelize a few people. And instead of doing that, why don't you consider this as a stocking stuffer or a gift to that sister or that aunt or that cousin or that neighbor that you know, you know, maybe they could hear it from these two. And trust me, if they can hear it from anyone, they can hear it from these two because it, it isn't a shame and a guilt and a you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to, you know, be uh, playing the game of Twister or everything's gonna collapse, you know? <laughs> so, so it's just a very good book. And thank you, you guys, for um, coming on. Thank you.